my God. Oh my God. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. Now, if you go to 9-11, it was a lousy conflict analysis because everybody asked, how was it done and who did it? The attack, you know, on World Trade Center and Pentagon. And the third one was meant to be the White House, but the plane crashed. They did not ask, why was it done? And so if you don't ask why, you cannot solve the problem. But that was not the intention for the US. The US wanted to exploit that victimhood, and I'm not underestimating it, but 3,000 people, less than 3,000 people were killed on 9-11-2001. Majority of which, or at least half of which, were not American citizens, but people who sat from all over the world in the World Trade Center. So, with due respect to every life that cost, the United States decided to exploit that situation for saying, now we're going to have a global war on terror. The GWAT, the global war on terror. Our war on terror begins with Al Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. That means wherever we think that the guys who did this came from, we are going to bomb and occupy. So on the 7th of October, they invaded Afghanistan. And so over the time, these 23 years, figures from Brown University and elsewhere in the US and other statistics have it that somewhere between one and five million people have lost their lives as part of the GWAT, the global war on terror that the US started and still has running. So instead of asking, why did they take the financial center of the world, the military center of the world, Pentagon, and the political center of the world, namely the White House, which was telling, you know, they didn't bomb any kind of, you know, museum building or hospital or something. They took the three centers at that time that should have been a message to someone. If you had read Bin Laden's book, he starts out saying that the West has done enormous harm, not the least mass killing people in the East, by which he referred to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So long story short, you overreact because you consider yourself a victim. Namely, you try to kill terrorists and say that thereby you will fight terrorism. That's not the way it works, because when you kill terrorists in the Middle East, Al-Qaeda or Al-Nusra, whatever, and by the way, the West has cooperated with a lot of them, for instance, in Aleppo in Syria, I've seen it myself. When you go for killing people, you don't solve the problem. What you should do is to ask yourself, why do people become terrorists? And when you have talked with terrorists and found out what their criticism and grievances are, how they feel marginalized, and why they use violence to get attention, then you begin to have a sense of what can be done. And I think that has been a devastating development for the Western world. The fighting after 9-11 all around the world by the US has contributed to making the US a, a, a more hated and having a more negative image than it otherwise would have had. That goes together with all the wars the US has, has lost. There's no wars it has won since Vietnam. It has lost all the, the wars, morally, politically, legally. The strong country, the strong society in which is one in which you are different elements of power are balanced equally much. A strong economy, strong political um, status, strong culture, strong 
uh, social patterns, cohesion, uh, strong legal power and legitimacy in the eyes of others. Now, if all these are sinking, but there's one you have, and that is the military power, you become a kind of drug addict, in this case, a weapons or militarism addict. And you will militarize yourself to death. Because the reason you have all this military is that you've taken the power from the economic power, the political power, the cultural power, and invested that in your military and warfare capacity. And the bottom of that, the basis that should carry this, is becoming smaller and smaller. And the West at the moment is the best at military power. It is declining in economic power, it's declining in political power, it's declining in cultural power, it's declining in trade. It's declining in global legitimacy. But the one thing the Americans and NATO can say is, we're strong, we can do things. Now, they lost all the wars since Vietnam, but put that aside, there's still, we can blow you up if you don't behave like we want you to behave. That's what happens at the moment because of this militarization against Russia, which is perverse because Russia was already a dwarf before all this started. Russia had 8% of NATO's military expenditures. Excuse me, nobody with 8%, 8 horses, does not start a war against somebody who has 100 horses. So this whole thing is fantasy. It is a way to legitimate your own, or cover up your own blunder called Ukraine a membership of NATO. If you ask me why NATO is spreading, it's because our leaders in the West believe that we're number one, we're second to none in the military sphere. That means you will see all problems around you as something that can be solved by weapons, by means of weapons or more weapons. That's why diplomacy has basically disappeared. That's why economic sustainability, underlying defense, has disappeared. That's why you don't care anymore about whether the rest of the world finds your policy is legitimate. And that's why you fight to preserve what you think you can preserve while everything else is falling apart. It takes no intelligence to start a war. It takes a lot of knowledge and intelligence to stop a war and create peace. And that's why I say there is a connection between intellectual and moral disarmament in the West. It doesn't matter anymore. We don't do diplomacy anymore. We don't take the other into account. We don't go for common security. We don't go for disarmament anymore. We don't respect the UN Charter because it's easier not to and just send some weapons. You see, the, the response from the West and NATO countries has been all the time, send more weapons. What do we do at the moment? The, the totally intellectually indefensible position and the presidential candidates and the US have it and built on it. We want a ceasefire while we pump in weapons and ammunition to Israel. Does that make sense? I think a child can see that that is stupid and doesn't make sense. I think it's, it's, there is a clear connection between militarism, armament, just hammering, you know, when you have a problem, Whereas you need intellectual rearmament and moral rearmament if you want to solve conflicts the productive and lasting sustainable way. It cannot be done by weapons, I'm sorry. And so this kind of intelligent conflict resolution is over. It's not used anymore. When, when I say these things here in, in, in the West, they say, oh, that's very idealistic. I don't know where it happens, but I think it had to do with the fact that the Soviet Union broke down. Warsaw Pact disappeared, and then you could do anything you liked. There was a free world for the West in 20 years where you could start any war, you could bomb here and there. There was no Soviet Union that could prevent it. There was no China that could prevent it. There was nobody else who could prevent it. Now, let me give you a personal um, experience that I had in the 80s. I'm that old. Our colleagues, me and my colleagues, were working for the Swedish Foreign Ministry, writing reports, doing con uh, conceptual analysis, uh, what is deterrence in psychological, political, and moral terms, and things like that. And they would get the material, and they would then say, come up that and that day, and we will go through your text, and we have a lot of questions to you. Why? Because Sweden needed, as a non-aligned to a certain extent, neutral country to devise, to develop its own policies and be unique because it did not just call Brussels or Washington, what shall we do? 
it had to, because it had its own policy, it had to be very, very solidly based in knowledge and clear concepts. Now, that's not the Sweden today. The Sweden today is a foreign policy that is completely in the interest of the United States. As a member of NATO, it has no independent foreign policy anymore. In my view, you could just as well close down the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, apart from ambassadors around the world, that's nice. And it is a total de-intellectualization. It's, it's a foreign policy and security policy, policy formulated without you needing any knowledge. Because you get the inspiration, the words, even the Twitter statements for press conferences, you get them through the Western influence. That's how the, <laughs> Sweden, where I come from or live in, I've seen this, you know, setting up of, of not only NATO membership, but 17, I said 1717, American military bases on Swedish territory, 15 in Finland, three in Denmark, and four or five in Norway, and more than 40 bases in one year set up in what used to be a peaceful corner of the world. Not only NATO membership, but bilateral agreements about bases, bases that will be under American jurisdiction where, for instance, the sovereign state of Sweden has abdicated parts of its independence and sovereignty and given it to the United States. For what reason? For being used if there is a conflict with Russia. Not that we have something that we can contribute, not something that NATO is interested in, not something the Western world could make good means of, so, such as a mediation capacity such as a strong disarmament policy, such as an ins inspiration or inspirational UN relationship. We don't have it. We have nothing to give anymore. Uh, you can add to that, you know, Ukraine with NATO expansion is a factor that makes the West go down because everybody who, who is not NATO can see that NATO was a main conflict creator until Russia, unfortunately and I would say not very productively invaded Ukraine, and then you had Nord Stream, and now you have the uh, genocide in Gaza. All these things are contributing to undermining the authority and credibility and legitimacy in the rest of the world's eyes of the United States and the Western world, NATO and the European Union. I have never been anti-Western or anti-American. But I feel it's, it's painful to see how nobody is threatening the West. But thanks to its own confrontational policy, its, its own militarism, its own, we can do nothing wrong, the hubris, we are demolishing ourselves in the West. I think that's very sad. And I wish there would be some leadership somewhere in the West who could say, hey, we've got to find out before it's too late. It has all the time been, we're doing nothing wrong. It's the others who are foolish or dangerous or a challenge. We keep on doing what we want. We step up what we do, not seeing that the, what they do has been self-destructive. And that's intellectually, you know, it's disarmament uh, while you promote uh, rearmament with military means. And that's very sad to see for those of us living in the West. KS Royal Face KS Royal Face 皇家颜值逆时奇迹系列 KS Royal Face 皇家颜值逆时奇迹